Okay, welcome back to the second lecture, BC 213, the end times. Um, we are continuing our lecture now. Um, any further questions <clears throat> based on the quick run through on the geography and the history? Say, go ahead, please. Yes, Pastor. Um, I was just going to ask, um, I didn't really see anything said about the U.S. knowing fully well how they are major players in the world. I don't know if scriptures kind of um, give us uh, uh, an explanation of their role, you know, in end time in in, in the whole end time agenda. Mm -hmm. Um, so I can speak, uh, so let me say, like, personally, right, in my, my study, my reading of the scriptures, I, uh, I do not see any specific reference to the role that the United States would play in all of this, uh, other than, you know, what we can infer, rather, there's no direct statement. Yeah. Uh, like well, like we were just saying earlier, when I mean, Revelation 19 says the nations of the earth come and then we say, yeah, definitely the United States will be info involved uh, just because we know what, what's happening globally. But other than that, in scripture, we don't see, at least in my study, I don't see anything specific. Now, there are people have tried to read into scriptures like for example I mean I think the correlation would be any reference to an eagle in the scripture they would say okay that refers to the United States you know things like that I, I don't see it that way uh, and so we, uh, you know we, basically there is no everything is surrounded around Israel as a nation and what's happening around that and uh, yeah, that would be my response. But there are people who try to stretch things a little bit. And uh, yeah, but I don't uh, necessarily see that as the right thing to do. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, I think somebody else raised, uh, uh, yeah, Elisha. Go ahead, Elisha. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor. Um, considering the, the biblical narrative, we realize that most of the references were made to kings. And looking at our, our contemporary dispensation, you realize that nations are not, many nations are not ruled by kings any longer. They are ruled by political leaders who are sponsored into power through their political parties. So um, I, I, I am wondering how we, we still can put political leadership in the, in the narrative of the, the Bible where it refers to kings who operated under a different dispensation than ours. So can you explain further how political leadership would play uh, their role in the, in the biblical narrative where kings were referred to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we must understand that a lot of things were written with the language and the understanding of their day. And it must be understood or interpreted into the context of our day. Simple example. In Ephesians chapter 6, writing to the church, Paul says, Servants, be obedient to your masters. We don't have servants and masters today. You know, we're living in a totally different context. Does that verse apply to us or should we not read it? Of course it does apply to us. But how do we translate it? Servants corresponds to employees. Masters corresponds to, you know, managers or bosses or 
organizational leaders. Similarly, Romans chapter 13, Paul is writing to believers. He says, be subject to kings, to those in authority, to soldiers who are sent by him to do you to correct, uh, you know, those who do wrong. Well, we don't have kings. We don't have authorities in that sense today. But is Romans 13 applicable to the church or not? It is applicable, but we translate it. We interpret it in our context. So in Paul's time, there were kings. There were soldiers who carried out what the kings wanted. There were emperors. In our day, civil authority is represented by, you know, a different form of government. But the underlying principle is be subject to civil authority. And also across nations, civil authority is not always democratic. It could be so many different forms of civil authority. But the underlying truth is, hey, you're a believer, you be submitted to civil authority in your context. So what are we doing? We are interpreting that and making it relevant to our day and time. And like this, there are many things, many other um, portions in scripture. And, you know, like what we learned in our course on interpreting scripture, scripture was written uh, in the language, in the culture, in the context of the author. The inspiration was given by the Holy Spirit, but the author could only write uh, in the language that they had available to them. But we, un we interpret it to our context. And that's exactly what we do even with Bible prophecy. So when Daniel wrote, he said, you know, I saw this beast with horns. Horns. Then he says, he interprets for us, the horns represent kings. Okay. The beasts represent kingdoms. Or, you know, the mountain represents Daniel too. A mountain represents the kingdom. So he's interpreting the imagery. So God is speaking to him through images. He's interpreting the images in the language he had, which was kings, kingdoms. But in our day and time, that translates to people in authority, people in leadership. Kingdoms translates to nations, right? So that's how we interpret it, just as we do with any other portion of uh, scripture. Is that okay, Elisha? That's very okay. That's very fine. Thank you very much, Pastor. Okay. Anything? Uh, okay. There's another question here. Of, um, there's a comment from Christopher. Historically, the U.S. gets itself involved in most major world events, which is true. I mean, today, right? Yeah. You know, at this moment, as we are talking, we are seeing what's happening. Russia, you know, has amassed its troops on the border of uh, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, and then who, who, who's the first major person, country to get involved, okay, United States. Of course, the others, you know, slowly would reluctantly come in, UK and the NATO and so on. But Russia is making a move, the US is responding. And so we can be sure that, you know, in Revelation 19, uh, US will get involved. Um, the VS question, where does the current world governments fit in Daniel's prophecy? So, uh, yeah, so Daniel chapter 2, like we were saying, uh, Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel talks about the feet, which are basically a, a mix of iron and clay, and out of that there are 10 toes, and then that parallels to uh, Daniel chapter 7, where he sees this beast coming forth with 10 horns, so it parallels to it. So what, what, are, what are we looking for? We're looking for... Um, Some, so this represented, basically this is the former Roman Empire because it comes out of that. It comes out of the legs of iron, which is the Roman Empire. So from that region, which is going to be a loosely held uh, amal amalgamation or a, a loosely held uh, uh, confederation of nations, which is a mix of people, from there are going to come forth 10 leaders, because he's a 10 kings, 10 horns representing 10 kings. So we're going to look for that. 
then like we already explained from what was for part of the former Greek empire, you're looking at the four regions in which it was broken. From there will come the little horn. So we're looking for that. Um, and then of course, Israel as a nation. And then all the other that we've already covered, you know, there's Russia, very clearly identified other nations, Turkey, Egypt, um, uh, the other tribes that have been identified. We're looking at all of them. So the names that have been specified in, you know, Ezekiel 38, 39, uh, uh, Revelation 16, so on, the names of those regions specified, those are things we are going to be looking at now. And uh, that's what we are looking uh, looking at, the current world governments. Did I answer your question, uh, Tivia? I'm not sure. OK. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I was uh, also thinking if uh, this mostly democratic governments that we have currently, uh, are, are those uh, referring to these loosely held uh, a confederation that you said yeah so the nature of the government is not specified in scripture right so the scriptures doesn't tell us okay they would be democratic governments so they would be you know dictators or you know imperialists or it doesn't talk about that it doesn't talk about the nature of the government it only says this is what you know you will you will see right and also the scriptures talk in terms of the tribes you know, so based on the tribes, we will interpret, yeah, that Rosh means Russia and so on. So we will interpret it that way. So, um, but it doesn't talk about the nature of the government. Okay, okay, best. Thank you. All right, one last question here. Christopher, how about India? It is mentioned that China, Russia, India is more like Russia than China, all the Indians in support of Israel. Yeah, so we don't know exactly what position India will take uh, in, in that Revelation 19 war. If you go historically, historically India has supported Russia and fought for Russia. So the Indian soldiers were actually deployed into, no, it was Israel, sorry. I had to correct myself. Historically, India has supported Israel and Indian soldiers were deployed in Israel and fought for Israel. So if that is, you know, I, we don't know what's gonna happen in Revelation 19, what, what decision India would make and the Indian government at that time will make. Uh, but if you go by history, historically, the Indian soldiers have fought for Israel. Um, maybe they'll repeat the same thing, they will fight for Israel, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to now um, move forward into our next chapter. Now this is the next two chapters. This is this one which we're going to start. We're going to be in it for quite a long time. That means we're going to, we're going to take it slow. I want you to understand it. All of this, all that we've covered so far is like, you know, just giving us a background so that we can get into the main part. We're going to take it slow. We're going to, I want us to understand it. this chapter, which is going to go through the sequence of events. Then the next chapter, which you know we will get into, is the signs of the times. That means, look, these are the reasons why we believe you're really close. And these are the signs you're supposed to be looking for. And almost all the signs we can list out from scripture, of course, are right there. So these two chapters would be the most, I would say, uh, the main part of the course, okay? So we'll take it slow. Uh, I want you to ask a question. Uh, please ask your questions uh, and so that you would be very clear on these two things, right? So uh, the Lord Jesus is coming back. And we start with that. Right there in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, as he was ascending up, into heaven. This was after his resurrection. He showed himself alive to his disciples for 40 days. And as he was ascending, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, uh, the angels spoke up and, uh, and you know, they said there in verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, 
who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So Acts 6, 11, clear statement. Jesus, who ascended, is going to come back. Right. And Revelation 22, the last chapter uh, of the book of Revelation, the closing chapter of the Bible, many times Jesus says, I'm coming back. I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Right. So the Bible, the New Testament, very clearly, is pointing to something in the future. Jesus is coming back. It's something we expect, we believe. And then there are a lot of things that are going to happen around that the Bible uh, speaks of. And what we want to do is to try to create an understanding of the sequence of events, what's going to happen, right? And I'd like to, you know, um, put it uh, put it in this chart like this um, uh, for us to understand, and we'll get into the details. So we are right now in what is referred to as the Church Age, from the resurrection of Christ or the ascension of Christ after Jesus ascended into heaven. The day of Pentecost, the church was born, and we are here. We are in the church age. I will just go over this high-level overview, and then we will get into the details. So what we are expecting next is the rapture of the church. That Jesus comes to take the church out of the earth. At the rapture, or the, the coming of Christ to take the church out of the earth, all who have died in Christ will be raised. And we will look at chapter and verse and scripture and all of this, okay, for all of these things. So uh, I'm just running through the timeline or the overview, and then we will get into the details. So all the dead in Christ will be raised. We will receive resurrected bodies. Those who have died before us, who have gone into heaven, will come with Christ. The spirits will come and receive glorified bodies. And we who are alive in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, our bodies will be changed. We'll meet the Lord in the air. That means he won't set feet on the earth at this, this point. And we take it up. Now, some, but some will say the word rapture is not found in the, in the Bible. And we will see that the word rapture is there in the Latin Bible, that uh, the word, the Latin word for, oh, that's used in First Thessalonians 4 is translated as rapture. That's where we get it. So you can't throw it out. It's there. And so we're going to be up in heaven. And uh, for a period of seven years. Now, during the church age, what we are going to, what we're going to do is we're going to map this whole thing to the book of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 is that, you know, uh, are things that have happened. Uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3 were things that happened around 1980. That was the time that John was there and he was writing. So those seven churches did exist. And the Lord Jesus was speaking to those seven churches. Uh, and since then, we are continuing in the church age. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is the scene in heaven right after the rapture. Revelation chapter, and I'll repeat this. Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is the scene in heaven right after the rapture. So why do you say that? Because we see the elders seated around the throne, around Jesus. They have received their crowns, which means they have received their rewards. And they are, all the believers are clothed in robes of righteousness. So it's a scene in heaven right after the rapture because they received the rewards. Revelation 6 starts off here, the beginning of the tribulation, all the way to Revelation. 1921, when Christ comes back. 
okay? The second coming of Christ. So it's describing these events that will take place during these seven years. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, all the way to Revelation 19, and I think it's verse 21. Let me just make sure I'm saying it right. Revelation 19. Uh, yeah, the, the Christ coming back. Revelation 19 and the battle of Armageddon, verse 11. 11 is the second coming of Christ. Okay. And then during that, so in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, all the way to Revelation 19, 11, there are times we are looking at earth and there are times we are looking at what's happening in heaven. So we're going up and down. We're going up and down between. We'll see what's happening in heaven. We'll see what's happening here on earth. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 to Revelation 19, 11. Okay. Now, what happens in heaven during these seven years? Well, Jesus said he's, <clears throat> he's building mansions for us. So we will be ushered into our mansions. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says believers... Uh, will receive their rewards. So that will happen here. Um, there's going to be worship happening in heaven. Believers are standing before the throne, worshiping Jesus. And Revelation 19 talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that will also take place. So some of the key events that are taking place in heaven during these seven years, we can identify based on what we see in scripture. Here on earth, during these seven years of tribulation, everything begins with the emergence of the Antichrist, who puts in place a seven year peace treaty. He uh, sets in place the, um, uh, the, off, um, the sacrifices and the worship in the third temple. He sets that in place, but then, there are a series of judgments being poured out on the earth. Um, there, um, there are, so we have three sets of seven judgments each being poured out on the earth. And we will see the sequence of those things. So increasingly things are getting bad. Now, other things we will see happening here on earth is the Revelation 7 talks about the 144,000 Jews who are set aside to preach Christ. So they will start off somewhere here in the beginning of the tribulation. There'll be 144,000 Jews proclaiming Jesus. Uh, we see there will be increased prayer and intercession happening. There will be people turning to the Lord Jesus during the, uh, the tribulation. There will be increased prayer and intercession happening. Revelation 8. Uh, there will be the uh, uh, proclamation of the gospel taking place during this time. Uh, Revelation 11, which is the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. Uh, there will be the breaking of the peace treaty and the desecration of the temple. The, the stopping of the sacrifices. Revelation 12, which is from the midpoint of the tribulation, there'll be increased persecution of the Jews and those who believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, prior to this, we see that there will be many people who will be killed for their faith in Christ and we'll find them up in heaven worshiping Jesus. Uh, somewhere right after the midpoint, the 144,000 Jews are taken up into heaven. Uh, we don't know exactly how they're taken up into heaven, whether they are raptured without dying, without yeah, without being killed or they're killed and resurrected, but we find them up in heaven. Revelation chapter 14. Uh, in Revelation 13, we see the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, the Antichrist uh, survives an attempt on his life. He's healed. And uh, so he is acclaimed as a celebrity. The world begins to worship him. The false prophet shows lying signs and wonders, and his main goal is to get people to worship the image of the beast. Uh, there's the introduction of a global 
economic or financial system, the mark of the beast, and also um, there is the uh, Revelation 13, there is uh, an introduction of this world religious system, which is to get people to worship the image of the beast. So this is around Revelation, Revelation 13. Uh, Revelation 11, going back there, we see the two witnesses whom God sends who will be ministering for three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation. The second half of the tribulation is also known as um, uh, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it's also referred to as the great tribulation. Uh, this entire seven year period is known as Daniel's 70th week or the time of tribulation. Uh, other things we see during this seven year tribulation is uh, uh, armies of the earth or the nations of the earth beginning to get pulled in to to be against Israel. The Antichrist will do it because uh, Revelation 12, he's all out against Israel. He begins to cause the nations, Revelation 16, cause the nations to be stirred up against the against Israel. Revelation 17, there is the collapse of the of the world religious system that was introduced by the false prophet. It just collapses the 10 leaders who lended their support to what the Antichrist was doing, pull out. And there's a collapse of whatever the false prophet was doing. Revelation 18, immediately right after that, there is the collapse of the global financial economic system that was introduced by the false prophet, uh, by the Antichrist, where he had forced everybody uh, to receive the mark of the beast. But that whole thing collapses. And then Revelation 19, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb happening in heaven. And then right after that, Christ returns, Revelation 19. By this time, the nations of the earth have gathered together against Israel. Christ returns, and then that's the battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon taking place. Jesus lands on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is split into two. Zechariah 14, uh, Joel chapter 3, the nations of the earth are against Israel. Um, and uh, Revelation 19 as well. And then by the word of his mouth, Jesus destroys all the armies. And here, he, set, he comes and he sets up his kingdom. There's the resurrection of all those, the tri tribulation believers, they are raised who have died during the tribulation, they are, they are raised to life. Satan is bound for a thousand years. The beast and the false prophet have been cast into the lake of fire. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And then Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand year period. And we have information from scripture on what happens during the thousand years. Uh, life goes on on the earth. You have people who have come in through the tribulation. They continue to live here. They multiply, they grow, and they are taught about the Lord. The nations of the earth are called in to come and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Uh, the kingdom has been handed to the saints, so we administer the kingdom here on earth. Um, there is a transformation in the nature of things because the Bible talks about the lion and the lamb lying together people beating their swords into plowshares. Uh, so there's a total transformation during this thousand year reign of Christ. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, uh, life goes on, on, on the earth for a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed for a brief period of time. Uh, he's, it's his final opportunity to go deceive the nations and go against Jerusalem, against the people of God. He makes his last attempt, God intervenes. Yeah, Satan is bound forever, cast into the lake of fire. And at this time, uh, the Bible says, every person stands before the throne of God. There's a great white throne judgment. Every person is raised up, brought back to life and stand before the throne of God. The book of life is opened and this is the final judgment. 
the separation uh, uh, you know, of those who are going to spend eternity with God and those who are going to be away from God. And uh, the, who, whose ever name was not found written in the book of life, they separated away from God into the lake of fire. And right after, right after the great white throne judgment is uh, the renovation of the heavens and the earth. So the Bible says there are going to be new heavens and the new earth. The old earth is going to be completely renovated by fire. That means it's, it's, it's no longer going to be the way it was. And um, heaven, heavenly Jerusalem is going to be brought to the earth. So everything's going to change. That's Revelation 21 and 22. That takes us into this new heavens and the new earth. Uh, what all is going to happen there, we don't know. But it's going to be completely different. Uh, we don't need the sun. We don't need uh, all the things that we are dependent on. God himself is going to be the light on the earth. Okay. So this is kind of a you know, quick overview. Uh, we will go through it you know, in detail. We will explain why these things are happening or, or why, why, it, you know, why we believe in the rapture of the church and all those things we will explain. Okay. Let me pause here and see if there are uh, questions. Somebody's mic is on. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, Go yes, ahead. yes, Pastor. I, I, I wanted to ask about um, rapture. Um, I believe, yes, uh, in the rapture of those who died in Christ and those who are still alive that are born again and walk in the righteousness of Christ. My question is, which I've been asked before, is what about all those before Jesus Christ? Um, what is the um, condition? Are they also going to rise um, on that day when Christ appears um, together with those who died in Christ after his resurrection, right? Um, so I'd, I'd just like to know what's going to happen to those before the resurrection, the death and resurrection of Christ, are they, are they already resurrected or are they going to also be resurrected um, 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 on the day of rapture? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we know is, so we go back in time to when Jesus died and rose up again. When he ascended, what we know is he took the Old Testament saints with him. Paradise was moved from the lower parts of the earth into heaven. So we know this from Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 8, 9, and 10. It says, when he ascended up on high, he took captivity captive with him. Paradise, which was in the lower parts of the earth, in the New Testament, after the resurrection of Christ, you find paradise in heaven. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, I was caught up into the third heavens, into the paradise of God. So where is paradise? It's up in heaven. So where are the Old Testament saints? That means those who, the righteous ones, the Old Testament saints, they are in heaven. The others are in hell. That means those who did not believe, they are in hell. But the righteous ones are in heaven. So then the next question is, when will they get their glorified bodies? If, because all of us are eventually going to live in glorified bodies, in bodies that are incorruptible and immortal, because the mortal has died, it's gone. Their spirit is alive, their spirits are in heaven. And likewise, those who have died since the resurrection of Christ, those who died in Christ, their spirits are in heaven, but the body's decay is gone. So the big question is, when will they receive resurrected bodies. The Bible, the New Testament, doesn't specifically point out 
Old Testament saints as you know, receiving resurrected bodies. But what it does say, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that those who have died in Christ, God will bring with him. Right? 1 Thessalonians 4. So, uh, and this is, you know, uh, an open for discussion uh, thing because the Bible doesn't specifically point out and say Old Testament, the spirits of Old Testament saints. But what I'm persuaded, and this is what I will be also sharing with you, is that First Thessalonians 4 will be a time when even the Old Testament saints will receive their glorified bodies because it says God... Christ will bring with him those who have died. Who? The spirits. And they receive glorified bodies. So we can position it either at the rapture of the church. So here are the options we have. At the rapture of the church or at the end of the seven-year tribulation. At some point, these people also would have to receive all their glorified bodies. Now we know according to Daniel chapter 7, that the saints, the elect, will also be on the earth ruling during the millennial reign of Christ, because Daniel 7 clearly tells us that. So that means they should, before, the, before the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ, these Old Testament saints should have received their glorified bodies. We have only two places we could position this. Either... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 or Revelation the chapter 20 verse 4, like when, when the dead are raised. So these are the two options. Some people position it here in Revelation 20. They say, okay, that's the time the Old Testament saints will receive their glorified bodies. I feel, I'm saying I feel because you know, I can't give you chapter and verse which specifies Old Testament saints. There is no verse that specifies Old Testament saints. But my feeling is that it'll happen in First Thessalonians chapter 4 because everybody going to be in heaven with glorified bodies from every spirit. The spirit of every person who's in heaven. Old Testament saying, New Testament, we're all in Christ. We're one new man in Christ. So together, and also another reason is Hebrews 11 says, and Hebrews 11 closes, it says, God reserved this so that we could together enjoy the benefits. Right? So that's again, it seems to be to me an indication that when New Testament saints receive glorified bodies, Old Testament saints will receive their glorified bodies, will be taken back into heaven. Does it answer your question? Well said, Pastor. Thank you very much. Yes, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Um, there are a couple other questions here. Um, let me see. And let's try to answer these. Mangi, what is the difference between the Battle of Armageddon and the Battle of Gog and Magog? So, um, the Battle of Armageddon. So, Gog and Magog. So the Battle of Armageddon takes place in Revelation 19, at the end of the seven-year tribulation. What is often referred to as the Battle of Gog and Magog takes place in Revelation 20 and, which verse is that? Um, uh, eight, at the end of the millennial reign. Okay, so let me repeat it. Battle of Armageddon takes place at the end of the seven-year tribulation, Revelation 19, verse 10 onwards, 11 onwards. Battle of Gog and Magog at the end of the uh, millennial reign, Revelation 20, verse 8. But one confusing piece, Gog and Magog is also mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 in connection with The Battle of Armageddon. So we shouldn't get confused. It's the same tribes, same groups of people fighting two times. <laughs> okay. But what is often referred to as the Battle of Gog and Magog is Revelation 20, verse 8, end of the tribulation, uh, end of the millennial reign. 
But Gog and Magog is also mentioned in this battle of Armageddon, which happens at the end of the seven year tribulation. Is that clear, Mangi? Yes, it is. Thank you, sir. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, next question. Elisha, Matthew 24, 14 talks about the preaching of the kingdom to the whole world as a testament to all nations and the end will come. When practically are we going to experience this? Revelation, uh, Matthew 24, 14. Elisha's question. So the answer to Elisha's question, Elisha, it is happening right now. So we are seeing Matthew 24, 14 being fulfilled right now. Literally, in our time, the gospel has reached almost every place. It, and it has, you know, it has really, it's been preached all over the world. We are down to, right now, we are down to about, I don't know the current number, but maybe 20,000 people groups. So right now we are counting people groups. We are not even counting nations or countries. We are counting people groups, meaning we are counting tribes. And they're saying these are the tribes that are left that haven't heard the gospel yet. So we've covered the nations. Every nation has the gospel. Now within the nations, we are counting tribes, making sure the tribes, the peoples will hear the gospel. So basically it's happening before our eyes and uh, many mission agencies are you know, doing focused work to take the gospel to the last remaining sets of tribes around the world. And you know, a major number of these tribes are in what was usually referred to as a 1040 window, uh, starting from basically, you know, covering parts of the Middle East, Northern Africa, all the way to parts of Asia, 1040 window. Uh, that's where most of the, what they refer to as unreached people groups, or this, these tribes are left. So it's really happening in our day and time, right before our eyes. And given with all the advancements we have, language translation is happening very quickly translating the Bible into the language of these tribes because uh, uh, the ability to, you know, the whole process of learning a new language, getting a script for them, and then putting the scriptures into their language is happening at, you know, at tremendous speed. So it's amazing. Okay, next question. Uh, Revelation 37, that the Antichrist will make war with the saints. Revelation 13, 7, yeah. So rapture will take place before tribulation. How will this take place? Yeah. Uh, the answer is very simple because from the time the rapture takes place, there are going to be lots of people who will turn to Christ. Lots of people. So during the seven year tribulation, lots of people are going to be turning to Jesus. The other saints. Remember we mentioned 144,000 Jews, God has handpicked them to be proclaimers of the gospel. So people will be saved during the tribulation. And we will see in the book of Revelation, there will be people who are dying for their faith in Christ, right? So the saints refer to both Jewish people specifically, as well as all those who believe in Jesus Christ. And a lot of them will turn to Christ during the tribulation. And so there will be the attack against these people. It's gonna be very hard but it's going to happen. People will turn to Christ. And all these people who've died as martyrs during the tribulation will be raised up. Revelation, the 20th chapter, and uh, yeah, verses verse 4 and 5. They will be raised up at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Okay, So that's what it's referring to, the saints who die during the um, seven-year tribulation. Before white throne judgment, how can people go to hell? So... God, so there's one criteria, so they believe in Jesus Christ. So they, if they've never, they're not been saved, they've not been born again, they are immediately, when they die, immediately sent to hell. Hell will be cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. That's Revelation 20 and verse 14 and 15. Okay, Anita, did I answer your question? 
uh, Christopher's question, those who have died in Christ since the New Testament, where are they currently residing? In heaven, right? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to pre be present with the Lord. So the moment a believer dies, they will go to heaven. I need this quite question. Why right throne judgment is for whom? It is for all the unsaved, right? So it's not for the believers. Believers are, have already been, you know, taken to heaven. They're already with Jesus. The great white throne judgment is for all those who have ever lived since from Adam on, who have not believed in Christ, they will stand before the white throne judgment. So you can think of as the great white throne judgment. Yeah, so they will all stand before the throne of God, right? So we will read it, right? It's Revelation 20 verse 13. It says, the sea gave up those who were in it Death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. Revelation 20, verse 13. So they'll be brought out of hell, right? From, from death, from hell, and they will be judged. You know, this is their standing before the throne, um, uh, the, before the throne of God. So Revelation 20, verse 13 answers your question, Anita. Okay. Christopher, I mean... The ones who have died in Christ who are part of the rapture. Uh, yeah, everybody who dies in Christ, they are with Christ right now. Uh, what is your question, Christopher? Uh, my question actually, Pastor, is um, in the rapture, uh, those who are currently living like us, um, mm -hmm will be will be will be uh, taken up um, as part of the rapture and in addition there are those who have died in christ so th are those are those who have are those people who have already died um physically died i mean and um, uh, uh, are they uh, are they also part of the rapture mm -hmm. everyone so like we were saying i was answering sai's question Everyone who's died in Christ, so their spirits are in heaven right now. So in at the rapture, their spirits will come and be united with, will receive resurrected bodies. And what I was saying to say is, not only the New Testament saints, but I believe it also includes all the Old Testament saints, right? The spirits of the Old Testament saints, because they've also been taken up into heaven. So everyone will receive their resurrected bodies. Everyone meaning those who died in Christ, uh, will the spirits will come with Christ and receive resurrected bodies. So we'll read this chapter. We'll read the chapter in text, First Thessalonians 4, and we will see that. So currently the, uh, the ones who have died in Christ and are, and are in heaven, uh, mm -hmm. they are not, they, they, don't, they don't have, uh, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, Glorified bodies. bodies. Yes. Yeah, so they don't have the glorified bodies. But remember, the spirit is a person. So it doesn't mean you know, that they are like unid unidentifiable flying objects. No, the spirit is a person. So they are very recognizable. They are spirit beings uh, without the glorified bodies. Okay, all right, one last question from Sri Kumar, then we'll wrap it up for today. Because thank you. Have... Can I? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Pastor, I need a, I need a clarification on uh, three things. One is, um, who are these elders? And um, second question is, when we, when we say that after rapture, we will be in seven years. Those seven years will be calculated. Um, in which way, like, um, you know, is it a, it's a, it's a spiritual terminology um, or it's a God's timing as it's seven years, when it says. And when we say 1,44,000 Jews, so even, is that a, um, you know, prophetical number or um, is it, um, is it the exact number, like 1,44,000 is a human understanding, is it just, is a human, human way of uh, thing or it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a prophetic number. That's all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. So, one of the rules 
that we said in our introduction on how we are going to interpret prophetic scripture is wherever something is literal we will take it as literal we will not take something that's literal and change its meaning right whatever's literal we'll say it's literal only when something is stated which the practical interpretation of it is illogical that means it's unreasonable it's not it cannot happen then we will look for the meaning of it in the texts to see if god himself is saying uh, that means this so the second and the third question the seven years it's literal seven years why do we say that i mean for, for many reasons when you go back to daniel's prophecy in daniel chapter 9 verse 26 27 angel gabriel said i'm talking to you about 70 weeks concerning your people and then he said the first 69 weeks this will happen now when you look at the 69 weeks you understand each week is representing seven years because 69 times 7 483 years and you look at that and that 483 years exactly was fulfilled so if 69 weeks translated to exactly seven years per week which is 483 years then there is no other way to interpret the last seven last week other than saying the last week is exactly seven years because 69 weeks was fulfilled already exactly as 483 years or each week representing seven years and you also find in other places in the scriptures that seven is used seven weeks you know is, this this weeks is rep, used to represent years we will look at the scriptures so when you look at joseph uh he, uh, he talks about seven years you know and, and so on so and, and when you look at um, uh, what's his name jacob and he served for seven years 14 years yeah, again you see that so both based both on the actual fulfillment of daniel 9 26 and 27 and the language interpretation of the number seven we can say with absolute confidence Daniel's 70th week represents exactly seven calendar years. The only thing that we can dispute is, is it the Gregorian calendar or is it the Jewish calendar? That is open to debate, you know. So there'll be a variation for a few days. Whether you're looking at the English calendar or the Jewish calendar, okay, fine, doesn't matter. But it is seven years. We cannot argue with that because the 69 weeks was literally fulfilled as 483 years. So therefore, so this th third part of your question, the 144,000 Jews, we will take that number as literal because when we read Revelation 7, he's talking about 12 tribes. So the 12 tribes is not metaphorical. It is literal. Why? Because go back in the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes. And God is selecting a certain number of people from each of the 12 tribes. So mathematically, it has to be 144,000. So if the 12 tribes in the Old Testament were all metaphors, then we would say the 144,000 is metaphorical. But no, no, the 12 tribes are literal. Therefore, the 144,000 from each totaling the number of people from the 12 tribes, therefore has to be literal, right? So we will stay with the literal in, in all of these cases. And your first question, uh, what was your first question? Ah. Elders, elders, elders. Oh, the elders, who are the elders? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the elders. Uh, yeah, so we will look at it again from scripture and you will find the elders. Uh, as you look through the book of Revelation, in another interaction that John has, one of them says, I am one of your brethren. 
So who are the elders? One of your brethren, one of the Jewish people. Uh, we will look at all these details. So in Revelation itself, it's telling us who are the elders, one of your brethren, one of you. you. So it's not an angelic being. It's one of, you know, John's own people. So that's why we are saying uh, the elders are representing the people who have been taken into heaven, who have now received their crowns, and are seated around the throne and together worshiping God. Okay. But we will look at all these, actually, these are all questions we will answer as we go along and we will look at the uh, uh, scripture references. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, it's just a quick overview. Now we're going to get in next week into the details and uh, you know it'll answer many of our questions. And it's something for us to think about. And, uh, yeah, and uh, as more questions come, we will definitely uh, do our best to find answers to them. Okay, thanks for your patient listening. Uh, let's wrap up. May I request somebody to please pray with the class and then we will dismiss. Who would like to close in prayer? I'll pray, sir. Go ahead, Mangi. Heavenly Father, we we are grateful, Lord. We we are grateful, Lord, for even though you are so magnificent, you are so powerful, you are so strong, you're so we are we are more than we can imagine, Lord. You choose mm -hmm. to reveal the future lord you, you choose to reveal your plan to us lord and through that we we may know how to live lord how to number our days jesus how to keep our focus on you lord and we pray as we learn about uh, the future event and the end times Reveal more to us, Lord. Mm. Soften our heart, Lord. And let your Holy Spirit brood in us, Jesus. And let what we learn, Lord, bear fruit. And let it let us also go and teach others, Lord, what we, 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 we are learning, Lord, so that they may also be aware of the time we are living in and also keep their eyes on you, Lord. We pray be, be, be with us until we miss again the next class in the mighty name of jesus christ our lord we pray amen amen, amen. all right thank you everyone uh so uh, we will get into details look forward to seeing you all enjoy the rest of the day god bless you see you again tomorrow bye now thank you pastor thank you thank you everyone.